All right, everyone can see it perfectly. Okay, we are on the first slide. Okay, and I think the one I have has several changes in it, Tawny. So the one you have is an older one. You probably have one that actually shows like an elephant in a room. Um, we have, I think I pulled up the one that you just sent to me. This is the well model oh. and flow characteristics. So okay, so you actually have the one that has the, you're actually showing the PDF. Uh, yes, I converted you. it to a PowerPoint real quick. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Tony. All right. So um, on that second slide, I was going. I was going through, and I apologize, everybody. This is kind of difficult for me, but uh, doing the uh, online stuff. But uh, on that uh, second slide, we're going to go through what is plunger lift, plunger selection, optimization, and maintenance. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started for sake of time because I've already wasted a lot of your time. Um, so the first, uh, go ahead and go to your next slide, Tony. Okay. And the first thing that we look at when we're looking at uh, wells needing intervention as far as some form of artificial lift, uh, we're going to look at it whether or not a well is liquid loading. And basically, um, when you're looking at that, uh, when a well first comes on, and if it's a strong enough well, uh, you could be at, uh, at rates as strong as what we call mist flow. Uh, and, and then as the well starts to fall off, uh, it can start to fall off into slug flow and then a churn flow and annular transitional flow and eventually disperse flow. Uh, when the well is falling off below critical rate, and you'll hear that term a lot when you're talking about uh, uh, well dynamics and applications for artificial lift as far as is the well flowing above critical rate? Is there an opportunity to help this well produce better? Is there an opportunity to keep this well from logging off to where it doesn't produce uh, using an artificial lift method? So uh, these are the flow characteristics or flow regimes when you hear somebody refer to that. So wells flowing above critical, they're able to carry that fluid. Uh, that next slide, Tony, I'm sorry. And it should be two, two flow, uh, two basically flow characteristics modeled on that next slide, Tony. Yes, above and below. Yeah. Okay. So when the well is flowing above critical rate, it's carrying all the fluid to surface, uh, equal parts, pretty much uh, a fluid and gas. Uh, you've got very little uh, collection of fluid on the side of the tubing walls. Uh, very little of that's fallen back. As the well starts to fall off below critical rate, uh, more and more fluid starts to collect on the side of the tubing walls and start to starts to fall back. Um, early in a well's life and high producing rates, plunger lift was never thought of before as far as providing benefit for a well like that, but we're finding now more off, uh, more cases than not. Uh, that we can we can actually intervene early in the life of a well when it just starts to fall below critical rate uh, to uh, to to better more efficiently get that fluid to surface, even in a what we consider a, a high uh, a high rate well high fluid rates as well as gas rates uh, compared to what we were doing 20 years ago on plunger lift. So on that next slide, Tony, uh -huh. it should be a variation of artificial lift methods uh, to to address liquid loading. Is yes. that what you've got on that, that next slide? Okay. Yes. So uh, methods uh, intervening with, with besides plunger lift when it comes to liquid loading and better producing a, 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 a gas or oil well um, is examples like intermitting the well. Intermitting just simply means shutting the well in, letting it build pressure, throwing the well open so that it can uh, throw some of that fluid surface with that extra energy or pressure that's built up. Um, Sometimes that's done uh, manually by shutting the well in one day, coming back to the next, letting it flow the next. Uh, but a lot of times it's done with, with uh, uh, um, controls and a, and a pneumatic valve where you're not actually having to be there to do that process. Um, other examples of intervention would be uh, foamer and surfactant, um, and then a pumping unit, of course, uh, downhole pumps, ESPs, gas lift, um, utilizing compression, uh, on, on the uh, flow line to reduce your wellhead pressure or just basically utilizing compression to uh, gas lift, maybe without the gas lift valves. Uh, and of course, plunger lift is another way to address liquid loading. And we're gonna fo focus on the plunger lift side of it. Again, if you have questions or if I'm going too fast, just shoot that in the chat to Tawny. Okay, so plunger lift solution. All right, so when we're looking, and that's the next slide, Tawny. Yes. Okay, so basically, uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip that slide. Go to the next slide, Tony, so I can just kind of get down to the gist of what plunger lift is. Okay. 
So to, to simplify uh, plunger lift and what we're talking about with plunger lift, it, it's simply just a mechanical interface between a fluid and a gas. No different than a bucket that you'd use to lift fluid out of a well. Um, uh, it, you know, as it says there, it allows more efficient delivery of fluid to surface, just like a bucket allows you to, to be more efficient and get getting fluid out of that well. So uh, just to keep things from getting over, over complicated, that's really what we're doing. We're putting a bucket behind that fluid that's in your well. And we're, we're letting that well lift that bucket itself. Now that bucket has to be properly sized and fitted to that well. Um, you know, a one gallon bucket's a handy tool. A five gallon bucket's pretty handy. But if I hand an individual that weighs about 120 pounds, uh, a uh, 25 gallon bucket, uh, that bucket may not do that individual any good because they can't lift even the, you know, the bucket full of fluid. So they're not gonna be real efficient at using that. So we've got to make sure the well because that's all we have to work with in plug lift is the well's energy and the well's volume. We don't have an external source of energy. We have nothing connected to that plunger that's going to pull it to surface. Um, so we're, we're limited to what the well's horsepower is and the well's volume to drive that plunger and the fluid on top of it to surface. So that, that bucket, you know, to, to, to draw a comparison there, has to be properly uh, fit to that well. But to keep it simple, you know, plunger lift shouldn't be comp doesn't have to be complicated. That's all we're doing is just providing a better way uh, to get that fluid to surface. I don't know, let's see, Tony, your next slide's probably just uh, what is plunger lift? Yes, so the next slide is, yeah, so it said what is plunger lift and you kind of talked about the bucket and then the next is a picture. Okay, is a picture of a of a of like a wellbore diagram or, yes. or a cross section of a wellbore. Yes. Okay, so this this is just to kind of give everybody an overview of what's going on with plunger lift. That plunger, uh, and I don't you won't have the ability to show my cur my cursor, but that plunger is at that bottom section of the well, uh, just about at the kickoff point near the curve. There's a spring down there to cushion that plunger. And what I'm trying to give you with this image is just the overall picture of how the, how the uh, plunger lift application is applied from surface all the way down hole. So that plunger is designed to travel, uh, you know, through most of the vertical section of the well and, uh, and a little ways into the horizontal. Typically, uh, we land those springs 45 degrees on average as far as getting into the curve. Sometimes we go deeper and some drier, drier uh, uh, some uh, uh, dry gas wells, we'll, we'll, we'll get out 60 degrees, sometimes even 70 degrees, but we have to be careful what plungers we apply when we run them out into that, into the curve. Um, you know, like a, a dart style bypass, and I'll get into this more as the presentation goes, it doesn't like to shift in that inclination. So we, we, we wouldn't want to run a, a plunger like that out into the curve. So if we're having to go into the curve, we would fit make sure we got a plunger that can handle that, that'll come back and, and transition when it gets in that curve. But you can see that plunger is going to travel all the way to surface and that well, for example, could be 5,000 feet vertical depth. Um, so that plunger is going to make that, that one mile trip, uh, sometimes one time a day, sometimes a hundred times a day, uh, just depending on how much fluid and gas that well is making and how many trips we need to make to stay ahead of that fluid uh, and, and provide a benefit to the production and, and to the well. So, so that just kind of gives you an overall picture of what's going on with plunger lift. The next slide, Tawny, should be just kind of a general definition of what is plunger lift. Yes. Are you on that? Yes, I am. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so basically, uh, plunger lift, I've already kind of mentioned that, hinted to that. We, we're limited to the well's energy. We don't use anything other than what the well gives us as far as to drive that plunger and fluid to surface. Uh, that can be a, a disadvantage, but it can also be an advantage. The advantage would be is we, they don't require a lot of moving parts. They don't require motors. They don't require electricity. They don't require extra expense. Uh, if we can provide benefit to that well with just a plunger lift system. Um, you know, a lot of times we just got a little six volt battery that powers our controller at surface. So, uh, and a, a six volt battery is cheap to replace if it ever goes out. So our, our power uh, needs and cost is, is very minimal when it comes to plunger lift. Um, the, the, Basically, what we're trying to do, and I, like I talked about with the bucket, is we're trying to find a, the most efficient seal we can get to get that fluid better to surface. Uh, it also helps uh, keep the tubing ID uh, free from restrictions uh, that can be caused by paraffin or scale. Um, and one of the biggest benefits, if it, if it benefits the well, uh, is it's probably 
the lowest cost artificial lift method in the industry. And if you just need an average cost, I would say an average cost of a plunger lift system, just the equipment alone uh, from a provider, uh, and I'm trying to keep this as, as commercial free as possible, but average cost uh, from a provider, just their cost would be around $5,000. And then uh, if you throw in the wireline cost to set the spring, uh, your, your surface equipment cost and, and a crew to install that, you're probably looking at eight to ten thousand dollars total install for a plunger lift system as compared to you know seventy to one hundred twenty thousand for a for a pumping unit uh, installation so the next slide tawny is a equipment overview yes okay and uh so on this at surface we have a, a lubricator uh is the first bullet point uh Sometimes I, I call that a launcher, and, and that, that helps people understand kind of what it's doing. Uh, when you know, people understand, a, I don't know how this ever got the term lubricator. It doesn't lubricate anything. It's actually uh, the, the surface component that allows us to retrieve and launch that plunger. So a better fitting term would actually be launch, launcher, but somewhere along in the uh, evolution of plunge lift, the, the term lubricator uh, stuck. So that's kind of what they're still referred to as. Uh, the motor valve or pneumatic valve is a key component. That's how we open and close the well. That's how we get the plunger headed to surface. That's how we get the plunger headed down holes by utilizing that pneumatic valve. Uh, we use a controller. Uh, when plunger lift first evolved, they were doing it manually, had a chunk of iron in the well, shut the well in, let it fall, come back the next day, bring the plunger up, let the well fall, uh, let the well flow, and then just repeat that process manually. Now we have all these automation controls to, to do that without having to be on site. We also have the ability with, a, with an arrival sensor to see that plunger when it comes to surface. So that arrival sensor, uh, Tony, I don't know if you can arrow to that thing that has the little E on it. Yes. And kind of show everybody. Uh, that device will talk to our controller and it could be either magnetic or it could be a, a motion sensor. And it would let our, our controller know that that plunger has made it to surface. And then we can make adjustments based on how fast that plunger came to surface or how slow it came to surface. Uh, the next component is your bumper spring, what we call bumper spring. That's a spring that's down hole that cushions the plunger uh, when, it, when, it, when, it, when it falls. We, we want fluid there to cushion the plunger, but we also want some additional uh, cushion uh, for when if, if and when that plunger does fall dry. We want something to cushion that um, uh, to protect the plunger as well as the, uh, the, the tubing uh, from any, any damage you could get from not having a bump, bumper spring down there. Uh, also, our, down, our downhill components are our plungers, of course. The, the workhorse of this application is the plungers themselves. Uh, surface equipment, Tony, on the next slide. Yes. Um, okay. You'll go through these individually. So, again, the lubricator, I put in parentheses, the launcher. Uh, it provides a, a, a means of, of conveying the plunger and retrieving the plunger. Uh, the uh, cap that uh, the eight round cap, a lot of them sometimes are bowling caps, but uh, within that cap, there's some springs that also cushion the plunger when it comes to surface. So it, it provides a secondary cushion, uh, secondary to the fluid that should be on top of the plunger. So when we optimize these plungers, the, uh, we want to have fluid on top of it. One, because that's what, they're, what we have in the well for the first place is to help with the fluid production. And two, having fluid on top of the plunger is gonna cushion that plunger when it comes to surface. Running plungers dry at high velocities, you tear up the plungers, you tear up the components in the lubricator. Uh, it's just, and it's going to shorten a lot, you know, shorten a lot of your plunger, not only tear them up, but, but we definitely want to optimize these wells where we're bringing fluid on, on every run. Uh, so uh, that's a, but that spring is what I always call the springs in the cap or a secondary uh, cushion for that plunger. Uh, a sensor I've already talked about. Uh, you can see where it's mounted on that lubricator to where it will actually have the, the, the ability to see that plunger when it comes through that lubricator. Um, the controller, it's to the right over there, mounted on the uh, vertical section of that flow line. Uh, it's an EPIC controller. Um, that's the brains of the operation. That's going to control the cycles we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Um, that, that particular unit's a six-volt battery, nothing complicated, a little solar panel that keeps that unit powered up and keeps it in operation. Um, the motor valve or pneumatic valve, again, that's, we, we use a, um, a solenoid latch valve within that controller to allow supply gas to go through that com controller and to that pneumatic valve. We're able to cut that supply gas off and, and, and open that supply gas to open and close that, that pneumatic valve uh, based on what cycle we are in, that, in, that, in the settings at that time. 
Hey, Clint, on the next slide, the yeah. sensor on the wellhead? Okay, yeah. So if you will uh, look on the lubricator of the launcher, uh, you can see that little E if you look and move your cursor over there, Tawny, at the bottom uh, portion of that lubricator. Do you see I, it now? I think so. I think it's a little blurry. Is it red? Yes, it's red. Yes, yeah, it's a little blurry. Yes. Yeah. And that's where the sensor, that's where you typically see the sensor attached on, on a launcher uh, or lubricator because we want to make sure we're actually seeing that plunger as it's coming through that lubricator. Sometimes you might put a little higher depending on what that plunger is trying to, I mean, a little lower if the plunger is trying to stall. Uh, sometimes it might be more towards the middle of those two outlets on that lubricator, uh, but but somewhere within that range is where that sensor is going to be mounted. Yeah. So. Okay, the next slide on the downhole components. Well, uh, it's sometimes what you end up. Okay, yes, downhole components. Okay, did somebody have a question? No, I think we just had some feedback. Oh, okay, okay. All right, so on the downhole components, uh, your, your, your bumper springs, uh, they can be conveyed multiple ways. Uh, the example pictures I gave you here, the two on the left are, uh, uh, both set with hold downs, which will be uh, they'll be set in the profile nipple, which could be a standard seat nipple, it could be an F nipple or an X nipple or XN. Um, they're designed to, to get a friction bite in those profiles and, and stay. We can put standing valves within those spring components to better trap the fluid uh, to allow uh, to to uh, to reduce fluid fallback to to guarantee us some fluid when we get down there with our plunger. And a lot of applications in drier wells, we do use the standing valves. Uh, we use a spring relief standing valve that allows you to relieve, uh, uh, relieve the pressure and or pump through those if you need to, but it does trap uh, enough fluid to guarantee you uh, uh, efficiency in a, in a drier, drier well. Um, the, the next component on the right is the top component of a stage tool, and we'll talk a little bit about stage tool. On the next, the fourth component from the left is the bottom portion of a stage tool, and we'll talk a little bit about those. The, the last component there on the uh, fifth from the left is uh, is a pack off, which if we're setting uh, with the tools that are kind of laying horizontally below that, could be a tubing stop or a collar stop, and we still need to have a seal uh, around our spring utilizing a standing valve, we would utilize that tool that's, that's called a pack off. Uh, it kind of sets like a little packer inside the tubing. Um, and then, of course, the plungers are on the right, kind of the workhorse of the operation. So, Next slide, Tony. Um, real quick question. How is the bumper spring secured to the tubing? Okay, so uh, the two on the left, uh, those are uh, set. So I'll, I'll kind of try to, uh, so I better, uh, okay. So the two on the left are set in what we call a profile nipple. So a profile nipple could be a standard seat nipple, which is a, which is a, um, like a one foot, sub which has a reduced id so uh, versus the tubing uh, id and so the spring has no problem going through the tubing id and then when it gets to that reduced sub which is a, a seat nipple uh it's just tight enough to get a friction bite on those little seals on the bottom portion of those springs and hold it in place and that's the two on the left now if we're not going to set in a profile nipple we'll use those tools just below those springs those those five tools kind of laying horizontally uh, those are examples of tubing stops and collar stops. So a tubing stop, we can set it anywhere in the tubing string. It actually has little friction um, slips that'll bite on the idea of the tubing. And then we just latch into that uh, tubing stop with our spring, uh, with a latching device. Uh, now the collar stop to the right of that actually sets in a collar recess. So where you have a, two joints of tubing uh, threaded together at a collar, there'll be a, lap, a gap between those two joints of tubing. So those collar stops have little um, uh, dogs or, or extensions that'll, that'll, that'll fit within that, that, that gap left between those two joints of pipe there at that collar. Uh, so that's another way we can hold that, um, that uh, spring in place. And sometimes we'll thread onto a collar stop with a spring, directly thread onto it and set it that way. And sometimes we'll do the same thing as with a tubing stop is we'll set it and then go back and latch the spring onto it and leave it down hole. Hopefully that answered the question, Tony. Yes. 
Okay, and the next slide is the three basic cycles of plunger lift. So yeah. the first cycle is when we have the controller in an open open state. So when I say the controller is showing an open state, it could be showing open, you know, depending on the type of control controller, it, it could be showing open time, it could be showing on time, it could be showing plunger weight. It just depends on the language of the controller. But what you're doing during that on time is you're waiting for the plunger to come up. You actually have the controller in an open state. The pneumatic valve is open, allowing the well to flow. And your controller and the uh, firmware inside the controller knows to be looking for a plunger. It knows to be looking for that sensor to see that plunger. So this is the time allowed for that plunger to come up is this open time. And sometimes that could be, you know, 30 minutes, uh, depending on the well. You could have an open time of, 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 24 hours, depending on what you're trying to accomplish with the well. But you're essentially waiting for that plunger to come up during the open time. The, the second uh, basic cycle is the afterflow time. So this is the time allowed after the plunger has came up, after your sensor has seen the plunger, and you're going to go ahead and continue to allow the well to flow. There are some wells, a lot of wells, that we don't afterflow at all or afterflow very little. There, there's some drier wells that, that require a lot of afterflow. So after that plunger comes up, it clears that fluid load. Maybe it needs to flow for a while to bring in the, enough fluid for the next run. And some, if you let it flow too long uh, during afterflow, you could bring in too much fluid, and you can't. Then you don't have enough horsepower or volume to lift that amount of fluid for your next run. So, uh, so your afterflow is that period of time after your plunger has made it to surface. Uh, the off time is time allowed either for the plunger to start falling to bottom when we're talking about bypass plungers and we'll get into more details on those or to get that plunger completely to bottom if we're talking about a conventional plunger like a dual pad or a brush or a bar stock plunger. Uh, so that's the time to get the plunger either started to bottom or get the plunger to bottom. So these are the three basic cycles. Now, uh, there are more optimization features than just these three cycles, but these are the three basic things. Um, and so the goal for these three cycles is to repeat this over and over and not have any failures. So uh, ideally, when you come to that controller the next day, there are histories, uh, history uh, access on these controllers that allow you to see uh, what, what the uh, well did as far as plunger uh, performance. So one thing you'll see is the plunger run times, how fast the plunger was running. Usually it shows anywhere from 10 to 20 of those run times on a, on a controller history, or if it's, if it's a SCADA, uh, system and EF, uh, via an EFM has, and then you have a um, a, um, uh, a web-based system or something like that where you're actually looking at the data. You can have all the run history if you want it, but just an on-site controller will just have a limited amount of history as far as run times. Uh, the other thing is just the amount of times the valve opened and how many times the plunger came up when the valve opened. So ideally, when you come to the well and you see that the the valve opened. 20 times and the plunger came up 20 times, that's, that's good. You want your plunger coming up every time that valve opens. Uh, so the goal is for that to happen. If that plunger doesn't make it up uh, during that allowed on time, so say we have an hour of on time and uh, that plunger does not make it to surface within an hour or a lot of time, there's a recovery setting uh, or, or a recovery cycle. What this is is typically extra shut-in time or extra off time to let allow that well to recover or build extra pressure to get that next load because it missed, for whatever reason, that plunger didn't make it to surface uh, like it normally does during that on time. So that fourth cycle, the if-then cycle, is what we call a, a, a mandatory shut-in or recovery shut-in to get that plunger hopefully up for the next run and let the well recover and start going back to making normal runs. Any questions on that, Tony? you got? No. So the next, uh, how we do this on the next slide, and Tony, just to make sure, are you looking at uh, three three pictures basically of a pneumatic valve, a controller, and a sensor? Yes. Okay. So how we control these cycles using automated controls is there are several ways to optimize, and what I just kind of referred to is, is a basic time mode where we use hours and minutes, and we're actually uh, adjusting off the hours and minutes. Another thing is uh, an auto adjust mode to where we are looking for a specific travel speed for that plunger and the box itself uh, makes uh, adjustments uh, to either the shut-in time, the afterflow time, um, or the pressures uh, 
and some boxes auto adjust on pressure uh, to get that plunger to run within that 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 desired speed uh, to surface. Uh, the other is pressure mode. Uh, if you're running conventional plungers, pressure mode is probably the best option to go uh, because you're actually running on real time uh, operations of that well. You're not you're not saying within an hour I hope it gets to this pressure. You're running off of the actual pressure. So whether that be tubing pressure versus casing, casing pressure, uh, tubing pressure versus the line pressure, or all three in relation to each other, tubing and casing, which would be your, your liquid load uh, versus a given line pressure. So you've got a lot of options when it comes to a, a pressure mode. A high-low mode, that's just, you know, a lot of uh, controllers are basically set up to operate off a high-low to where if, if the line pressure reaches a certain amount of pressure, it'll shut in, and, and, if, it, and if it drops below that pressure, uh, it'll come back on. If it drops too low, same thing, it can shut in, it comes back above, it can open back up. Um, and then B-valve, I referred to that, that's where you're running sometimes two valves uh, on, with a controller. Uh, when the sales valve times out, uh, you can go to the to a vent line to the to atmosphere to better get that plunger surface, and then when the plunger comes up, it'll transition back to the sales line. So if you ever hear somebody refer to a, a B valve or a tank valve, uh, that's what they're referring to is is an automated means of of uh, of uh, venting a plunger to surface without having to to be on location. And then we'll, that that controller and these modes, we're all working with our, with our workhorses there, the uh, pneumatic valve. Uh, and the sensor all working in conjunction to make this happen. Any questions on that, Tony? Yes. Is there any right. visual indication at the wellhead as to where the plunger is currently at or in what cycle, or is that the only visible in the controller display information? Is that only visible? Yeah. So, so on the screen itself, on the, on the, uh, if you look at the picture there, uh, on the screen, it has all the, the uh, if you if you go through it, it'll just show its current mode when you when you actually wake the screen up. It'll just show whatever, and, and most controllers are the same. Uh, it'll show what it's currently in. It could be in open time, it could be in afterflow, it could be in shut in, it could even be in mandatory recovery when you get up to it. And then you can, depending on the controller, it's either number functions, set functions, or arrow controls to arrow down to the other things to see either the history or to make changes into into those settings you can do all that right there on the controller or if you have uh, web-based access or server access and a SCADA system uh, you can have all those those controls and that visibility from your computer now as far as seeing where the plunger's at with, within the tubing string you know we don't we don't have that kind of visibility but we we, we will know by looking at the controller what status uh, is currently in whether it's an afterflow shut in uh, or um, uh, open time looking for a plunger by just looking at that screen or looking at your, your computer screen, if that helps. Um, it's, okay, so he said, okay, but can you not look at the wellhead and tell what the status, tell what the status is unless you are looking in the controller box, correct? Yeah, you have to look in the controller because the uh, there's, there's no indicator uh, you know, visible indicator that the plunger's up or you're waiting on a plunger. So you have to open that controller up and, and, um, and see what status it's in. Perfect. Thank you. Now, when a plunger hits, you can hear it. <laughs> you know, a lot of times you can, if it's bringing fluid, the wellhead will shake, you know, or you'll, you'll actually hear that fluid come to surface and then you'll hear that. Hopefully you hear a nice little soft click when that plunger comes to surface. If you're hearing a bang, and not much fluid ahead of it, we definitely need to do some optimizing on our settings uh, to figure out what's going on there because we don't want to repeat that that process over and over of, of a dry plunger hitting. So so you can definitely hear it, uh, whether it's hitting soft or whether it's hitting hard, you'll hear it at surface when it comes up. Wouldn't a SCADA system tell you? What's that? A, is it a SCADA or SCADA system? SCADA. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, SCADA system. Yeah. So it, it'll just tell you just like the controller will. Uh, so say you're on your computer and you're looking at it off, you know, off site. It'll tell you whether it's an afterflow, whether it's, you know, an open time, uh, whether, whether it's in shut in. Um, and, but, uh, and then also give you the history of what it's done, you know, the last however many runs and also the, uh, the, uh, the, the amount of open time and close time, all that kind of 
historical data you need to have for that well to better optimize it. On the previous question, do you have a small video that maybe you could send so they can kind of see what you're saying? Yes, I can probably do that. Uh, I'll, I'll send it to you, Tony. You can share it with the group. Uh, but uh, this, this, and, and apologies for this, this presentation was actually kind of set up to go along with a well model where we can actually visibly see this on about a five and a half foot tall um, acrylic well model. We actually run the tools and you get visibility on that as well. You see the fluid, the gas, the plunger all running in tandem. Uh, so this is kind of where uh, I typically, when I do this presentation, I kind of go back and forth from the presentation to the well model. So I, I apologize for that. If there's some questions, I'm leaving unanswered. Perfect. Okay, so if you will go to the next slide, Tony. Yes. And that one should say plunger selection criteria. Yes. Okay, so I kind of give you an idea on the equipment overview, kind of uh, how we're doing all this. But uh, the big question is, is plunger lift a, a fit for my well application? Uh, you know, uh, it, like any form of artificial lift, just you have to size it for that well and determine whether or not it's going to even work for that well. And uh, to do that, just like anything, you've got to have good, have good information, you know, garbage in, garbage out, as the saying goes. So if you get good information, you're going to get a good recommendation. If you just get limited information, uh, you know, we're just going to be trying to give our best guess as to if that plunger is going to help or run in that particular well application. So some things we typically look for when evaluating well for plunger lift, uh, if you look at the upper left, there's a wellbore diagram uh, that gives us all the particulars as far as uh, the tubing uh, detail, the casing detail, where our perfs are at, uh, where our tubing is landed, uh, do we have a packer, no packer, um, where, do we have a profile nipple, do we not have a profile nipple, are there gas lift valves in the hole, uh, so, and then uh, gives us an idea of uh, any other anomalies that could be in that uh, wellbore that we need to be aware of when evaluating for plunger lift. Uh, the next slide is the deviation survey. If, if we're looking at a horizontal application, we'd want to we'd want to utilize that deviation survey to make sure we're setting at a proper depth to what we, uh, for what we're trying to get out of that well, uh, and then what type of plunger we need to utilize in that well. So there are some plungers that just don't like running the horizontal. And there are some that 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 don't know if they like it, but they just run better in the horizontal. Um, so we just need to make sure we we actually look at that deviation survey and determine where we're going to set our tools uh, based on the depth we're trying to, to lift from. Uh, the next thing is good production data. Uh, you know, usually I like to get 90 days, three months worth of the most recent production history. Um, you know, uh, gas, oil, water, uh, tubing pressure, casing pressure, line pressure, any notes that somebody has for those 90 days that, that tell you what's going on as far as, you know, if it's on compression, how often that, is that compressor going down? Is it constantly, you know, is there any other issues that might be noted that we need to be aware of within that, that 90 days of production history? And then if it is a gas lift well, and we're looking at doing a, you know, a gas lift, plunger lift combination, uh, it's, it's really critical to have that uh, gas lift installation sheet, which is that last thing on the bottom right. Uh, that's an example of is a, is a gas lift installation sheet. We need to know what, where those valves are, and we need to know what their their closing pressures are really more than more than anything when we're looking at combining a uh, gas lift and plunger lift uh, for say a gapple what you what you sometimes here referred to as a gapple application gas assisted gas assisted plunger lift Tony, the next slide yes okay so you, you we hope that a well is a is a high volume well or a high enough volume well that it would support a bypass plunger. That would mean that your well's a better well. Uh, so when I'm evaluating a well, the first thing I look at is it will it will it support a bypass plunger? Can we shut that well in at a minimal and keep it producing to make the maximum amount of gas? So I start at the top of what I'm wanting that well to do and work my way down as I'm evaluating it. So just a quick glance tool is a minimal gas rate for bypass plunger lift. Um, is it going to be a fit for a bypass if somebody sends me a, a candidate? Uh, so. Uh, all this is is mainly focused on wellhead pressure, and it's looking at different tubing sizes to give you a general idea starting point of can this well support a bypass plunger. So, Tony, if you'll just move your cursor down to the 50 on the pressure on the PSI on the left. Mm -hmm. 
and then go over to where on two and three eighths where it shows two ten. Yes. So what this basically means is that 50, 50 pounds uh, wellhead pressure, you would need a minimal gas of 210 MCF to support a bypass plunger for that application. Again, a bypass is a minimal shut-in plunger. A plunger is going to fall against flow uh, and, you know, greatly reduce the amount of time your well shut in in a given 24-hour period. So will this well support a bypass plunger? It will if it has 210 MCF at 50 pounds flowing wellhead pressure. Um, if your well is making 120 MCF, and it's 50 pounds uh, flowing wellhead pressure, uh, you're, we're probably going to have to look at, at the conventional. So this is just a quick way to say, hey, do I need to go conventional on this, or do I need to start looking at a bypass? If it's making 300 gas at 50 pounds wellhead pressure, I'm, I'm going to start looking at a bypass uh, application first thing. So on the next slide, Tony, or you may have some questions on that. Do you have any questions? No. Okay. On the next slide, so if it does fit into that minimal requirement for, for gas versus a bypass plunger, we take it a step further. And when we're evaluating uh, bypass plunger applications, the best tool we found is using, uh, whether for a bypass or a gap, gap will candidate, um, we use a, a, data, a downhole critical rate calculation. Uh, and then we use a percentage of that to determine whether our plunger has a good chance of running. Um, so we like to keep candidates uh, in two and seven eighths, under 300 barrels. Now we've worked with more. Uh, we've worked with, with wells that make up to 500 barrels and has success. But uh, just kind of a rule of thumb, uh, things just seem to work better and they fall into easier operations if we're under 300 barrels in two and seven eighths. Uh, candidates under 200 barrels in two and three eighths, again, we've worked with more. And we've had success with more, but more of our success comes from wells that are under 200 barrels in, in two and three eighths. So if you have that question of, of how much fluid can you work with in a, with a plunger, uh, then two and seven eighths, right around 300 barrels, and two and three eighths, uh, a max of 200 on, you know, for most of your success stories. Okay, so how do we calculate this downhill critical rate and utilize that tool to determine whether it's a bypass uh, plunger candidate? So, Tony, if you go to that next slide, it should be of that downhill critical rate calculation? Yes. Okay, so uh, just real quick, uh, uh, so downhole critical versus just critical rate or Turner, Coleman, whatever. Uh, Coleman, Turner, they use uh, basically uh, a wellhead pressure versus a tubing size to come up with a critical rate. There's very other little inputs that go into that. Uh, some correction calculations, whatever you want to call them, are, are factored in. But, but again, it still doesn't factor in how much fluid it just talks about a droplet of fluid suspended within a, a given tubing ID at a wellhead pressure. Uh, downhole critical rate is more specific. It factors in how deep uh, we're lifting from it, how much fluid, uh, how much oil versus water. Um, the, 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 the wellhead pressure, just like it does with, with a standard critical rate calculation, but it also factors in temperatures on a downhole critical rate calculation. So our temperature, um, the condensate gravity, as well as the, uh, the water specific gravity, all those extra things are factored into this calculation sheet. So uh, Tony's gonna share this calculation sheet with the group. Uh, so how you use this sheet is all the yellow highlighted information. Uh, you plug in those numbers. Uh, when you get to um, your condensate make, which would be your oil, uh, it's actually, uh, the input is in barrels per million, which would be liquid to gas ratio. Uh, so when you want to actually put that in, put in the number uh, liquid to gas ratio and hit calculate, and then it will calculate your barrels per day. So you may have to put in that input several times until you get the desired uh, barrels per day you're looking for to the right. And you can see that, Tony, if you can move your cursor over there where it says, it's kind of a little red highlighted box about a third of the way down on that graph or yeah. on, that, on that spreadsheet. Okay. So, to, so you need to have that calculated correctly. So once you have that calculated correctly and you have all your other information in there, it'll give you a gas production rate. So that's the green number at the bottom in a box. Tony, if you move your cursor down there where it says 594. Yes. So that's an actual downhole critical rate. And out to the side, there's a 70% in yellow required for a bypass plunger. And then in red, it's that 70% that value of that. So for this given tubing size, depth, amount of fluid, uh, amount of oil versus water, uh, it would require uh, 416 MCF to, 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 for a bypass plunger 
to, to have a chance to run and be successful in this application. So that's just taking it a step further than just saying, you know, it meets the minimal gas rate. Um, you know, it falls under some old general rules of thumb. This is actually taking it a step further and applying what's actually going on in the well to give us a, a, a more accurate critical rate that we can then in turn use to determine whether our plunger is going to be a, uh, a good fit for this well. So once we've determined a well is, go ahead and go to your next slide, Tony. Okay. It, it, it would operate with a bypass plunger. Uh, then we want to, then we want to determine what type of bypass plunger we need to run. So there's a variety of sizes and shapes, all, um, and I'm not going to spend too much time on the slide. They're all designed to give us different fall speeds against different rates. So because we are falling against rate with bypass plungers, or when you get the, or, or we're needing to get it, needing to get the bottom really fast. So uh, your ball and sleeve type plungers, and go to the next slide, Tony, real quick. Okay. And that should show a picture of those uh, to the bottom left. Yes. And we'll come back up to that next slide. So the ball and sleeve type plungers, the sleeve itself, uh, I apologize for the angle of the picture, is hollow. Uh, it's got a hole all the way through it. So it has no problem following its flow. Uh, even some extreme, when I say high rates, you know, in two and three eighths, we can get these things to fall against in, in rates as, as high as 1.2 to, to 1.5 million, depending on our wellhead pressure. Uh, and then the ball, since it's there, they can be separated at surface. The ball can fall independently of the sleeve, and that's a, you know, if it's two and three eighths, that's a one and three eighths inch ball falling in two inch ID tubing. It has no problem falling its rates, and they both can fall pretty fast against those rates. Uh, so, um, so on the higher producing ends of 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 a, of a well, we would probably use utilize a ball and sleeve type plunger to get the most bypass area we can around that plunger in a flow condition. Uh, to get that plunger to bottom. So when those two meet up on bottom, that ball and that sleeve, uh, they become one piece. And they, and now that they're under the fluid, they drive that fluid to surface. Now, I don't have a good picture, and I apologize again. I usually have these tools in hand as I'm giving a presentation. Uh, so at surface, in that launcher, that lubricator, there's a rod that will separate those two when they hit surface to get that ball to fall independently from that sleeve. So that now you can take advantage of the bypass area around the ball when it falls, and you can take up advantage of the bypass area through the sleeve when it falls. So that's how those operate. Go back to that slide before, Tony. Okay. And you're going to have this presentation, and for sake of time, I'm going to kind of speed up. You're going to have this presentation so you can kind of get an idea off this uh, chart of, of what kind of fall rates and fluid rates we can work, work with uh, with these particular types of uh, – of, of sleeves, whether it be a 12 inch steel uh, down to a eight inch titanium and two and three eighths and same and two and seven eighths. So you, you'll have those uh, on this presentation. Ball weights and fall rates with or the, the reason we utilize uh, different ball weights uh, is to get, you know, faster fall rates uh, in, in higher uh, producing conditions. So the he from left to right, the heaviest is the heavy tungsten. And you can see a two and three eighths that weighs 14.5 ounces. That's almost a full pound on a little inch and three eighths ball. So that's designed to go against your highest fluid and gas rates. Um, you don't want to utilize that in a dry gas well. That, that heavy tungsten ball will, will, will destroy your downhole spring if you utilize that and say a well is making three barrels of fluid and 300 gas. Uh, or 500 gas and three barrels of fluid, you're going to destroy that downhole spring. You want to run that in the well that fits it, you know, higher fluid rates, higher gas rates to where you're not, where you got plenty of fluid down there and rate to slow that ball down before it hits your, your downhole spring. Uh, your tungsten, just standard tungsten is a little bit lighter uh, than your cobalt. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is heavy tungsten and tungsten is slightly magnetic, but not very much. Cobalt is completely non-magnetic. So if you you can't retrieve really those first three balls with a magnet, but you can retrieve them with a standard overshot inch and three eighths uh, fishing tool, wireline. So that's how you get the balls if you ever need to go down and get them with wireline. Uh, the steel ball uh, is probably the most utilized we have. Uh, it is magnetic, obviously. And then you get lighter with a zirconia ball, which is actually a type of metal, but it doesn't look metal. It looks more like a, um, a ceramic. And then titanium is the lightest ball we utilize. Again, all to be better fits against different flow rates with the ball and sleeve. The next slide, Tony, 
should be referring to a dark plunger? Yes. Okay. This is a different type of bypass plunger. Um, uh, it doesn't have quite the same fall rates as a uh, ball and sleeve plunger, but it can be a better fit on a, on a lot of wells. Uh, one, because it's just one piece, uh, and uh, so it doesn't have those extra components you have to deal with. Two, it's typically a longer tool, so it has a better seal area uh, for the length of the plunger. Uh, so uh, you still get the fast fall. Maybe you don't need as fast fall as, you, as with the ball and sleeve. You still get the fast fall. You get fall through through rate. Uh, when that dart hits bottom, if, if, Tony, if you move your cursor down to the bottom left portion of that plunger. Yes. When that dart is extended, that, that plunger is bypassed. It's open throughout, like it is now. When that, when that little dart uh, is closed, when it hits the spring, it becomes, uh, it actually can now act just like a standard uh, plunger uh, and, and drive that fluid uh, to surface. Uh, so, and then when it hits surface, it also, also hits a rod that shifts that open and allows it to be bypassed again to where it can fall fast and fall against, against rates. Um, so that's how that, that tool works. Uh, advantages to that tool and disadvantages. So advantage to that one over the previous tool. The previous tool, ball and sleeve, we have to have some afterflow uh, because that ball has to get a head start. If that ball doesn't get a head start, that sleeve will catch that ball and they will come to surface premature and potentially not under fluid where you want it to be. So it has to have some amount of afterflow to get that ball a head start. A dart plunger, uh, does not have to have afterflow. You can hit surface and go right back down if you need to. So if you're if you're struggling to get ahead of the fluid uh, by giving it afterflow, maybe maybe you need to go to a, a, a dart plunger depending on the rates. It may be a better better fit for the well anyway. A disadvantage to a dart plunger, two disadvantages. One is the curve and the lateral. Uh, they don't shift as well uh, out beyond 45 degrees. That ball and sleeve, they'll typically meet uh, beyond 45 degrees, no problem. Uh, but the dark plunger doesn't like getting out into the inc inclination and still being able to shift closed to be able to come back to surface. Uh, also, another limitation to this is sand uh, or solids. Uh, dark plungers, uh, with the way that mechanism works, the way that dart shifts back and forth inside that, they can get uh, uh, fouled with the sand and it won't shift properly. It gets stuck open or stuck closed and can cause problems. Uh, if, if it's not a sandy well, no problem. If it is, you might have to go back to a ball and sleeve. Not that the ball and sleeves is going to totally solve your problem with sand. It's just a better solution if you're going to be fighting sand and, and a bypass application is, is to go with a ball and sleeve or any solids for that matter. Next slide, Tony. I'm trying to speed up here because I know everybody's looking to lunch here. Okay. So if, 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 if it's not a bypass plunger candidate and, or, or, or it wasn't a bypass plunger, but now the well has fallen off, it no longer can support a bypass plunger or from the initial evaluation, it's just not going to be a uh, bypass plunger candidate, per, but perhaps it's a conventional plunger candidate, a well that's going to still benefit from a plunger, but it's not going to have the volume to continuously run that plunger with very little shutting. Uh, so uh, when we look at uh, a conventional plunger and selecting uh, whether or not it's going to be an application for that, uh, the first thing that we look at typically is the liquid to gas ratio. And so if it's above 150 barrels per million, it very likely may not be a very good candidate. It may be just too much fluid. Um, so, uh, and I'll get more of that liquid to gas ratio here in just a second. Uh, and the second thing we're going to look at is, uh, is our casing pressure versus our either, either our shutting casing pressure or our shutting line pressure if we have a packer versus our line pressure. Typically, if it's a, if it's a, uh, a well that doesn't have a packer, uh, general rule of thumb is you need two times the amount of line pressure uh, your casing needs to be able to build to that. So if you have a line pressure that's 50 pounds, your casing pressure needs to at least be able to build to 100 pounds to have a chance for a plunge lift, uh, for a plunger to, to work in that well. If it does have a packer, uh, it's not an end game. You can run plungers in packered wells. Tony, you're still there, right? Yes. Okay. You can run plungers in a well with a packer. You just got to be more aware of what kind of horsepower you got to have. So rather than two times the amount of, of casing pressure versus line pressure. Now you're just limited to tubing pressure only because you have this packer and you don't have the advantage of having that uh, casing pressure to give you that extra volume uh, as well as pressure. So typically at least three times your tubing pressure needs to build above your line pressure. 
Next slide, Tony. Yes. Okay, so when we're looking at that liquid to gas ratio, uh, well, I've laid out an example here. Uh, if a well is producing 15 barrels of fluid and 200 MCF a day, okay, the LGR is 75 barrels per million, which would be less than that 150 requirement. So this candidate would fall into uh, a conventional plunger candidate based on liquid to gas ratio. So to get that, to get that uh, calculation, of the, some in the room or some in this, uh, uh, this meeting may be familiar with this calculation, some may not, but that calculation is there for you. Uh, and it'll be on the presentation that Tony's gonna send to you. Yes. Okay. An older rule of thumb that you'll hear a lot in plunger lift, and some of you may be aware of this this uh, this calculation, is 400 uh, SCF per bar per barrel per thousand feet of lift. Uh, that was kind of an older uh, rule of thumb. Uh, we're finding more often than not uh, uh, on a lot of wells. It's, it just there's there's some gaps it leaves as far and not that there's not gaps with the liquid to gas ratio. Uh, but but there are some gaps that this older calculation uh, leaves. So I'll give you an example here. A, a well making 100 MCF a day um, uh, and 30 barrels of fluid. Uh, if you use that same calculation, uh, that would would come up to 476 SCF per barrel per thousand feet of lift. The criteria uh, for that calculation says that yes, it would be a candidate. However, in my experience, and, and if you ask a lot of people that have ran plunger lift or, or currently serve some plunger lift, uh, there's not many wells out there, especially if that fluid is all water, uh, that you're going to be able to lift uh, 30 barrels of fluid uh, from 7,000 feet with only 100 MCF a day. So that's kind of an example of a gap that that older calculation can, can leave. We still use it, and I, I still give that, that, that result to people when they send a candidate, uh, but, but again, it's not as utilized a tool as it used to be. Okay, optimization um, on the next slide, Tony. Yes. So when you're so you've you've decided based on some selection criteria that you're you're going to put this well on plunger lift, whether it be a bypass plunger or a conventional plunger, depending on what you're trying to accomplish with the well and what the well is able to accomplish given its horsepower and volume. Uh, so to optimize your plunger, there's some things you've got to know and be aware of. Uh, one is you know the need to know the depth of the spring. Where's your spring at? How deep are you going in this well? Uh, typically, if it's an on-site controller, some controllers actually have an input. You can put into the controller what that depth is. Some controllers don't have an input. Uh, always write it on the inside of the controller on the panel what that spring depth is to give the lease operators a good idea of where they're coming from with their, with their plungers. Um, it's critical to know how far that plunger is traveling to determine how, how fast it needs to come to surface in minutes. Um, you need to know the type of plunger you're running. Uh, it, there's a lot of times I go out uh, and service a well for, a, you know, a given company and a lease operator calls me or a foreman calls me and says, hey, we inherited this well. We have no idea what's going on with this thing. Can you come out and give us an idea what to do with this, you know? And uh, I get out there and the first thing I want to do is I want to pull that plunger out and see what's in there. You know, what are we running? Uh, and then, then get with that foreman and lease operator and talk about production, what they lease. You know, sometimes they have limited information if it's a new well to them, but we got to start getting to the bottom of it, figure out exactly what kind of production this thing has, what type of plunger's in it, and where that spring's at. Uh, know the average fall speeds of, of the type of plunger you're utilizing. I'm going to give that to you later in the slide. Hopefully, we can get there. Uh, and the recommended rise velocities, how fast that plunger should come back uh, in minutes to surface once it's opened up. Uh, uh, another just a little rule of thumb is always reduce your off time to minimal before adding afterflow. So when you're starting up a new well, you should not ever add afterflow, especially if it's a uh, higher fluid volume well or a weaker well, until you uh, have minimized your shut-in time. Uh, once your minimal off time is uh, reached for that style of plunger, uh, then you can start to allow uh, more uh, afterflow and allow more fl fluid to feed in. Uh, Another thing is we, I see a lot is uh, with gas lift combination systems, uh, uh, plungers running fast, they continue to add afterflow, and they optimize the plunger. The plunger's optimized with the gas lift. That's great. They got their afterflow out to two hours, and the plunger's running at the speed you want. It's making fluid. Uh, the, the gas lift is doing its job. They're both doing their job, but the question is, why do you have two hours afterflow when you have gas lift on the well? Wouldn't it make more sense to reduce something that costs you that costs you money that also could be hindering the well's inflow? So instead of 
adding afterflow to a gas lift combination system, uh, or uh, why not reduce your injection uh, instead of continuing to add that afterflow to optimize your plunger? Because that's the goal of it anyway, is why you're, why you're putting those two systems together, uh, a plunger with gas lift, is to hopefully reduce the amount of ejection required to produce, produce the fluid the well makes. So that's a common thing I see is, hey, don't forget, you can slow that plunger down by reducing your injection. That's kind of the goal of this. Um, a real quick deal when it comes to optimization, and this is also falls under maintenance. If a plunger stops running, you get out there and it shows failed run after failed run on your controller. And before you start making any changes or shutting the well in, trying to get it to recover or throwing it to atmosphere, trying to get the plunger up, always check the lubricator to make sure the plunger is not stuck at surface. Countless times I've been out and, uh, you know, the plunger won't run or I can't get it to run. I've tried everything. And uh, I either ask that, that individual with a phone, have you checked the lubricator to make sure it's not hung at surface? And they call me back, it was hung at surface. Or I get out there and it's hung at surface. So make sure you always check to see if the plunger is at surface before you start trying to troubleshoot and do a bunch of extra steps that you don't need to do. Um, golden rule for plunger lift optimization uh, is we want to get the minimal amount of off time uh, with the minimal amount of afterflow uh, unless getting the plunger to run or travel speeds require more of one or the other, but you never want more of both. You don't want to have um, a lot of off time and a lot of afterflow, if that makes sense. Um, you know, uh, you're defeating your purpose. The more runs we can make in a 24-hour period, uh, the better that well is going to produce. Now, those runs have to be productive runs, not just runs for the sake of runs. They have to be making fluid. they got to be at the right speed, but we want to get as many of those as we can in a 24-hour period. If you're running a well with – it only takes a plunger to get the bottom 30 minutes, and you're running with two hours of shut-in, and you're giving it a four-hour afterflow – you're, you're basically yo-yoing the production that well. You're sending some back to formation, bringing it back in. So basically, you always want to try to minimize your shut-in time. And if, you, if it's a, uh, a productive enough well in fluid volumes, you also would want to minimize your afterflow so you can get more runs in a 24-hour period to better get that fluid to surface. If that plunger is running fast because it just doesn't make that kind of fluid, then you start adding afterflow to slow it down. But never just flow a well just for the sake of flowing a well once it's on plunger lift. As soon as that well became a plunger lift well or a plunger lift application, it's no longer a flowing well. It's now a surging well. We want to surge that thing as many times as we can in a 24-hour period and, and not tear up our equipment. Okay, so, Tony, I know I'm, we've got about a 15-minute late start, so I've got what, maybe five minutes left? Yes. Okay. All right, so oh, on the next few... Okay, what that, causes the plunger to get hung at the surface? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, something that causes a plunger to get hung at surface, sometimes it could be components of the surface equipment. Maybe it could be a piece of the little spring at surface is flaked off, sticks a plunger. Sometimes it could be something flaked off the tubing ID that sticks a plunger. It could be something that came from formation, a solid from formation that sticks the plunger at surface. It, and it's good that it's stuck at surface with that because sometimes they stick down hole. But uh, and then again, it could be sand or uh, other solids that, that's produced from the well that could be sticking that plunger at surface. Uh, so I found anything from frack plugs to uh, pieces of frack plugs to pieces of ceramic disc. You know your pump out plugs, pieces of that has stuck plungers at surface. So the worst thing to do is sit there and shut in a well, vent, vent it, all this, go through all these processes, and find out a day later that the plunger was hung there at surface the whole time. So. Hopefully that gives you some examples of what could stick a plunger at surface. Yes. Okay, so the next few slides I'll kind of go through quick as I can because mainly they're just information that you're going to have because you're going to have this presentation. So how fast do these plungers fall? That should be the next slide, Tawny. Yes. Okay, so these are just general rules of how fast they fall. This varies quite a bit based on tubing pressure. Uh, you can utilize the echometer technology, and if, uh, if you're not familiar with that, uh, you should really go, you know, look that up, uh, look up echometer and kind of what they can do with plunger lift because it's really good stuff. Uh, you can track a lot of these plungers successfully with that, with that technology, uh, and you would be amazed at how much tubing pressure affects how fast these things fall. So, you know, a, a, a pad plunger falling in a uh, uh, 100 pounds tubing pressure is going to fall a lot faster than a pad plunger falling in 600 pounds of tubing pressure. 
so uh, so we try to hit the middle ground with these general rules when it comes to uh, how fast these things fall. Uh, we're more conservative. They probably fall faster than this in a lot of cases, but we're just trying to be conservative so that you have a better idea as what to set your wells up for to match uh, and get either getting at the bottom or getting that plunger started at the bottom. So that slide shows you, and you can see the, the disparity in, in, in fall speeds starting at the top from a pad plunger all the way down to a two-piece bypass, you know, the kind of velocities. And a two-piece and, and a low-pressure well can fall a lot faster than 2,000 feet a minute. Uh, we've seen it, and uh, uh, it can cause some damage if you're not turning that well on before that thing gets to bottom. It's not good to run these bypass plungers from bottom. You want to turn that well on before they reach bottom so that you can slow those things down. Uh, you're going to start to tear up equipment. Rise velocities. So, Tony, this is uh, on that next slide. Yes. If you'll, you'll notice, I'm just going to highlight a, cu a couple of big things on this. Notice none of these rise velocities are above 1,000 feet a minute. Uh, that's kind of a, a, a window we use to say, hey, you're kind of getting in the ground or territory that can start tearing some stuff up. Uh, not always the case. There are some wells that you're out there and it's, it's traveling over a thousand feet a minute coming to surface uh, and it's bringing fluid and it's not hitting hard. You know, if you're there and you're seeing that, maybe it's not a big problem. But generally, we try to tell everybody to keep your plunger travel speeds less than a thousand feet a minute. You're starting to exceed that. You're starting to run the risk of shortening the life of your plunger, shortening the life of your surface tools. You're starting to, to be able to uh, tear some things up. So try to keep your speeds below a uh, thousand feet a minute. Uh, bar stock plungers, the third item on there, uh, this is something pretty common that I see is people aren't running those fast enough. Uh, they try to run them like a pad plunger, that 550 to 600 feet a minute, sometimes 700 feet a minute. You really need to run those faster because the seal comes from their speed. They're a turbulent seal plunger, so they've got to have some speed to get that fluid to surface. Uh, they don't have bristles like a brush plunger that, that create a seal or those pads expanded out in the tubing ID to create that seal. So you really need to run those a little faster. Uh, a brush plunger, because it is a, a good sealing plunger, you can run those a little bit slower. Um, and then the bypass plungers, uh, the big thing that, that there is uh, the sliding sleeve is a, is a transitional plunger. You're going to run it from bottom. So again, you're looking from bottom to top trip, so seven to 900 feet a minute. It's just like a bar stock, so it's going to be, it's going to be uh, the sealing efficiency comes from its speed. The next thing you see RT out beside those highlighted in, in yellow. Uh, the reason that's RT is that stands for round trip. So there's a little bit of round trip involved in this bypass plungers because we're turning them on before the plunger gets to the bottom. So your on period also includes fall of that plunger. So it's it's not quite a round trip because a lot of times we'll turn it on. It's a third of the depth of the well when it comes on, or sometimes it's a little half the depth of the well by the time it comes back on. Uh, but it is, uh, you know, you have to figure in some amount of round trip. So if you'll see a lot of those travel speeds are 500 to 600 feet a minute uh, based on the fact that that plunger is going to be started at bottom, but it's not going to be on bottom when the, when the well necessarily opens up. Okay. Any questions on that, Connie? No. Going kind of fast. No. Okay, the next slide is, is just some tools. Uh, that Someone asked a good question earlier about plungers getting hung at surface, and I mentioned that that's a good thing. They're hung at surface and not down hole because they do get hung down hole. So if you are utilizing plunger lift and you get a plunger that's not coming to surface and you're getting gas rates and fluid rates but the plunger's still not coming, uh, there's a good chance the plunger's hung down hole. Don't feel like you have to call a wireline rig uh, right away. Uh, we have some tools to try to drop and retrieve that plunger, maybe to free it up. Uh, some of the tools are just magnetic. Uh, we can grab it with a magnet. And then some tools actually latch, depending on the style of the plunger, we can latch onto that plunger to try to free it up and to save you uh, the cost of a wireline retrieval on a plunger if it's hung down the hole. Um, in the next few slides, Tony, I'll try to go quick. If you just skip the first one and go to the next one that has the, uh, the X's yes. on it. Okay, so when we're maintaining a plunger, the, 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 the thing we do more often than not is we're checking the plunger. So there's a big safety consideration when you're checking these plungers. Uh, so one is catching the plunger, isolating the lubricator, uh, and bleeding it down so that you can safely retrieve that plunger or launch it, uh, the plunger. Then I put a big red X around that motor valve and a no above it because you never want to rely on that motor valve as your isolation uh, 
a tool uh, because that box could signal it to come open and now all that line pressure is going to come back at you. So always close uh, those two ball valves if they're there at the lubricator. Close your master, of course, and there's usually a bleed point provided on these, on these launchers and lubricators to safely bleed the pressure off of that before you open that cap and retrieve that plunger out of the well. If you don't have those two ball valves there, there's a ball valve downstream typically somewhere that you can close, but just don't rely on that motor valve as your uh, isolation point uh, when you're service, surfacing uh, the plunge lift. Um, that cap, whenever you put it back on the well, uh, it's, it's an O-ring seal. Uh, so just hand tight, snug it up, and then when you go to take it off the next time, you can get it off pretty easy. If you ever put a wrench on it, it's gonna be really hard to get back off the next time. So just usually, they're, you know, usually just snug it up and it's good to go. You don't have to get crazy with it, tighten that cap up. So things to look for on that lubricator are pointed out on this. You know, you want to look at the, you know, a lot of uh, lubricators these days, the cap comes off and the springs are exposed. Sometimes they're not. They're actually are housed inside the cap. You just need to check that tension on the springs or visibly look at those springs and see if they're okay. Uh, um, so you can see that uh, downhole spring is actually frequency. We'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, you want to make sure your motor valve is holding and working properly. Sometimes you can have problems with the plunger not running consistently. consistently. And it's just the motor valves leaking by. It's not getting a good seal and closing like it should be during that close time. Make sure your sensor is still working correctly. Uh, you know, look for any leaks on any of the surface equipment and make sure the O-ring and the lubricator cap is still good when you're inspecting that. So when we're doing maintenance, we want to try to avoid things, uh, you know, like uh, the picture on the, at the top there with that cap basically blown up. Uh, you know, I'm speculating here, but probably the well was shut in for a long time, had a lot of pressure, maybe the spring was compromised, uh, and that thing was brought on, and with no choke, uh, nothing to slow the plunger down, no fluid to slow it down, hit really hard and basically blew that cap up. So we want to try to avoid these kind of things as far as major catastrophes. We also want to avoid, um, you know, springs being collapsed, and they start to provide, they start to impact your plunger lift life by just having a spring collapse at surface. So you can see some examples of springs uh, and, and the wear on those that you need to be looking for when you're checking those at surface. Um, you know, in plungers themselves, you want to try to avoid getting those big cracks in the tools. You want to try to catch them before they get to that point that they're about to, uh, to come apart. The next slide, Tony, should have the diaper on it. Yes. So a big thing in service, surf, Getting people to buy in to regularly checking their plungers, I always like to give this example because you always, I mean, it is, it is extra work and, uh, uh, to, to check it, but you do need to check them uh, regularly. You know, uh, I always give the example of I've got three kids and I did it with all three. I never learned my lesson, but uh, a kid's crying. I'm giving them a bottle. I'm giving them everything. I'm, you know, trying to entertain them, trying to get them to laugh, get them to stop crying, everything in the world. And, this kid can't communicate me no way but crying. And I've done everything. I've held the baby, rocked the baby, everything I can do. The one thing I never thought to do was basically check that diaper to see if that kid was wet. And simple fix, check the diaper, kid was wet, put the diaper on, the kid's happy again. But yet I fought it for, for an hour. So what, what I tell people is if you'll check these things regularly and replace them as needed, your, your well will be a lot happier and the, 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 the tools uh, will be, uh, the, the application will be a lot more rewarding to you. But if you're waiting until something happens to react to the plunger uh, or maintain that plunger, it's, a lot of times it's too late. So you don't want to overcheck them or change them. You don't want to be changing your plungers every month. It's like you wouldn't want to change a baby's diaper every 10 minutes just to make sure that that's never a problem because they're going to get expensive. But you do want to check them regularly and change it as needed, if that makes sense, so that helps you out. I always like to give that example. Okay, Tony, next slide. I'm, I know I'm out of time, but I'm going to make it quick. Um, real quick question. Check how regularly? Weekly? Monthly? What? Yeah. Good question. Okay, so if it's a conventional plunger and it's running six times a day, uh, you can probably check that once every two months. If it's a bypass plunger and it's running 60 times a day, I'd check it once a week myself, but at least once a month. I wouldn't go over a month checking those bypass plungers. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Uh, plunger inspection and specs. So what we're looking for as far as OD, 
uh, wear on these plungers when it comes to solid type plungers, whether it be bar stocks or bypasses that have that solid uh, turbulent seal mechanism. Uh, so uh, these come new in two inch versions or two and three eighths at, at 190 OD typically. Uh, uh, at you probably need to start looking to replace those at a 188 or less because you'll start to lose some efficiency. You'll start to see your production numbers falling off a little bit. Uh, and then eventually if it gets, you know, depleted too much, you could have a problem. That, that plunger could eventually stall and it's going to be hard to get that thing back to surface. So at about 188 or less, and then just like that on the 2 and 7 eighths at 2340 new, uh, when they start to get to about a 232 or less, you're, you're getting into a time where you need to start thinking about replacing that, that plunger. So if it's a ball and sleeve plunger, you've got another component you need to think about. That's the ball. Uh, so how do you know if you need to replace the ball or not? So the, the best test I can give you is the water test. So use a new sleeve, not a wore out sleeve. Put the ball in place. Pour some water on the top. If that water doesn't run through, just like te testing the, 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 the trim and seat on the motor valve, if that water holds, uh, that ball's good. If that water's running through on a new sleeve, uh, the ball's probably uh, wore out enough. It, it's time to replace it. It's got divots and dents and, and pitted, pitted areas that are going to cause you problems in that ball, so it's time to replace it. You get a lot of life out of a ball, uh, especially a tungsten ball or cobalt. I mean, you're probably going to get 10, 12 sleeves wore out before you ever have to replace the ball. It, it, it's one of those things that gets overlooked sometimes because a well that ran normal for a long time, you just change the sleeves regularly, never gives you any problems. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's starting to give you problems. You go through all these things to try to fix it, you never think about, oh yeah, that ball does wear out. So it's usually like one of the things that happen rarely, but it'll catch you, it'll bite you sometimes if you're not checking that ball. Uh, again, 10, 12 sleeves uh, per ball usually as far as uh, life of that ball. It lasts a long time. Uh, pad plungers, it's a little, there's some more things to check on your pad plungers. You're not necessarily looking at OD. You've got uh, pads that, that, that expand and contract with springs behind them. So you need to be checking that spring tension. If you lay a pad plunger on its side and those pads collapse and they're setting on metal, like there's no spring behind them, they need to be replaced. There's also wear indicators, which are usually little lines or emblems or logos carved into those plungers that will if they start to fade, it's time to replace that plunger. Uh, obvious things like cracks and breaks and things like that, like in the picture here, you need to keep an eye on. Uh, on your downhole springs, how often should you service and replace those? Uh, so if you're running conventional plungers uh, uh, on a downhole spring, you, you could probably get by once every two years on a conventional. Uh, it recommended an inspection, sometimes three to four years if you're just running a conventional plunger. If you're running uh, uh, bypass plungers, I recommend once a year, but at least be checking that spring once every two years um, uh, if you have a bypass plunger, because it's going to take a lot of abuse. Uh, a downhole spring is with a with a bypass plunger. Stage tools, and for sake of time, I didn't get get a chance to get in a stage lift, but I'll mention it. That's when we're running multiple plungers in a tubing string to overcome a lack of horsepower or a lack of volume or or a higher wellhead pressure than what we run we would be able to run with with a conventional plunger. It just allows us to cut down that distance uh, from downhole to surface and reduce our time to get that plunger to surface. So. If you are utilizing a stage lift system, we recommend to pull that stage tool about every two years and service it and inspect it. I know I went fast, and I apologize for the uh, the, um, the technical part of it, difficulties at the first, but uh, hopefully that uh, that helps some of you out as far as just a general idea of plunger lift, and I maybe got into some specifics that helped some of you. Any questions? I'm... Not seeing any more questions. Oh, wait. Okay, we have one. How do you check downhole spring? Okay. So on the downhole spring on that last slide, so we utilize wireline to have tools and uh, to convey these tools that are downhole uh, to set them in place. And then we also we utilize a wireline or slick line rig to go grab uh, to go grab those tools and bring them back to surface so we can look at them. Uh, so 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 wireline is how we uh, typically uh, uh, convey the tools and get them back to look at them. Now, in I'll give you an example. So, in that where we don't is uh, when we use a floating spring. A floating spring is a spring designed to, to not come to surface, but it just sets on top of the uh, profile. Uh, we use those usually in like high CO2 areas where they want to inspect their springs often. And so, 
we'll use a floating spring and then we'll drop a magnetic plunger on top of that floating spring to get it to surface. And a lot of times in these high CO2 areas, they'll pull those, those downhole springs about once every six months with a magnet just to check them out and make sure they're okay. And that, that cuts down their wireline costs. So uh, when I say, I see that a lot in, in uh, the Haynesville, uh, Louisiana, East Texas, uh, where, where you have these uh, wireline costs that are pretty high. And so they're just trying to get away from that if they can by utilizing floating springs. But that was a good question. Awesome. I think that's it for today. Thank you so much, Clint. I'm so sorry that we've had some technical difficulties with getting this started, but I hope everyone um, at least got some information out of this. We will have this available um, through YouTube. We'll have the presentation and we'll have the calculations. Like I said earlier, just shoot me an email. Um, I put it in the chat, but just in case, it is tklaus at soarok.com. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Thank you so much, Clint. Yep, thank you. Have a great day.